on Straight Talk Africa, a conversation with America's top Africa diplomat, Linda Thomas Greenfield. This on a range of U.S. Africa policy challenges and opportunities. That's coming up next right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello, welcome to Straight Talk Africa, live from the Voice of America studios here in Washington. It's Wednesday, August 17th. I am Shaka Sully. Well, hello to you, Shaka, and hello to all our viewers and listeners on the continent and elsewhere. I'm Mariama Diallo, your social media reporter. Today, it's a conversation with America's top Africa diplomat. And as you can imagine, we'll have a lot to cover. Coming up later in our STA inbox, we'll share your thoughts on the issues that are dear to your hearts. And hopefully, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield will have answers to your emails, tweets, and Facebook comments. That's ahead on Straight Talk Africa. Hope you'll stay with us. President Barack Obama says Africa needs strong institutions, not strong men. But some critics say the administration has delivered more on style than substance. My colleague Paul Sisko has more. Linda Thomas Greenfield is President Obama's top person for African affairs. She's dedicated most of her lengthy career in government to the well-being of the African people and U.S.-African relations. She recently addressed several hundred young African leaders in Washington, D.C. Empowering young people is at the heart of U.S.-Africa relations. Our mission is to partner with Africa to promote democracy, peace, prosperity, and opportunity. She considers the Mandela Washington Fellowship Program one of President Obama's most important initiatives. As we work toward these goals, I can think of no better partner than all of you, the Mandela Washington Fellows. Thomas Greenfield has served as Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of African Affairs since 2013, was ambassador to Liberia from 2008 to 2012, and before that led the Bureau of Population, Refugees and Migration as Deputy Assistant Secretary. She served in Kenya, the Gambia, and Nigeria. From Nigeria Sunday, a new video from Boko Haram brings renewed attention to the plight of the Chibuk schoolgirls in northeastern Nigeria. Despite efforts from the international community and Nigerian government, the militants are still holding more than 200 of the 276 schoolgirls seized in April 2014. The extremists are demanding the release of captured Boko Haram fighters. <laughs> Zambia's incumbent president, Edgar Lungu, was declared the winner in a close contest over opposition candidate Akaenda Echelima. The opposition United Party for National Development accuses electoral officials of collusion and is appealing the result at the Constitutional Court. The commission and Lungu's patriotic front party both reject the charges. Finally, South Sudan, where yet another ceasefire between forces loyal to President Salva Kiir and former First Vice President Rik Machar has broken down. The United Nations Security Council voted Friday to bolster its protection force to the area in and around Juba. The regional protection force has been created in response to the collapse of security in Juba, and it will remain until South Sudan's leaders take the steps necessary to provide that security for their own people. Until the leaders of South Sudan are willing to put what is good for their people before themselves, putting peace ahead of personal ambition and power, and until they show the will to find a political solution to this grinding conflict, the people of South Sudan will continue to suffer from the bloodshed and instability their leaders wreak. Further, the United Nations and the United States have strongly condemned a target attack by South Sudanese soldiers last July, including rape and murder against aid workers and a journalist. President Keir has authorized an investigation into the attack. Paul Sisko, VOA News, Washington. Thanks, Paul, for that report. Um, joining us here in our Washington studios is our distinguished guest, Linda Thomas Greenfield, the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. Well, I have to say, of course, uh, uh, as always, uh, how profoundly honored and uh, exceedingly humbled I am to have the opportunity to ask more to host you on Straight Talk Africa. Well, thank you, and I'm delighted to be here with you as well, and I also am delighted 
to uh, share this podium and to have a discussion with your audience. You're most welcome. It's been quite some time since uh, we last saw you in this studio. Where have you been, Linda? I, I think I've been in Africa. I spend quite a bit of time on the continent. Uh, and uh, when I'm in Washington, uh, I'm working on Africa. Very interesting. Later in the program, we'll give you, the audience, a chance to call and talk with our guest. The number to call is 202-619-3111, and the U.S. country code is 1. Let me come to you uh, immediately. You obviously have been dealing with a lot of pressing issues, and uh, we're talking about uh, the most recent independent nation in the world, South Sudan. Yes. Your reaction? Sadness, simply sadness. Uh, the people of South Sudan had suffered for too many years. Uh, they fought for years for their independence. And two years after their independence, they are being tortured and uh, harassed and forced into refugee status again because of the lack of leadership of their two uh, major leaders. Do we sincerely know why they are fighting and what they are fighting about? Because when you look at the leadership in terms of uh, their attire, for example, they are in some of the most expensive suits in 100 degree temperatures, frankly, and their people, the ordinary South Sudanese, frankly, uh, live in very, very subhuman conditions. You know, Chaka, I wish I can tell you what they are fighting for. I suspect that they are fighting for the resources of South Sudan, and those are the resources that they use to purchase those expensive suits you're describing. But you're talking about uh, a country, Linda, here. First of all, it is blessed. It is a huge country, much larger than the current East African community countries, really. Yes. It has oil. It has one of the most uh, large, fertile lands that mm -hmm. is not under cultivation. It could, in fact, become a, the breadbasket of the region and yes. beyond. Yes. They have gold, you name it. And there are very few people in them. I, I see the same thing, and I think uh, all of their neighbors see that. And so there's no reason for uh, this country and for these leaders to be fighting over these resources. There are significant resources in South Sudan to provide for the needs of all of its people. Yet uh, the international community is providing millions of dollars in humanitarian assistance to respond to a devastating humanitarian crisis in which uh, people are on the verge of famine. Uh, almost a million South Sudanese have uh, been forced into refugee status and they are all being supported by the international community. Uh, yet this country, as you said yourself, has abundant resources that could provide for all of the needs of its people. When you talk about uh, aid workers, of course, uh, there is uh, a very, very uh, tragic report, frankly. Uh, uh, stuff that happened about uh, July 11th. Yes. Uh, in the neighborhood where there is a terrain hotel. What can you tell us about that? You know, I, uh, first of all, let me just say uh, how extraordinarily uh, horrific uh, that situation uh, was. I just read the article uh, in the, uh, that AP uh, put out, and uh, I was uh, aware uh, that this situation uh, happened. And uh, it is important that uh, we hold those who are responsible for this attack accountable. Uh, and the UN Secretary General has called for that and called for an investigation of the attack that targeted this hotel. Uh, there were international staff there. Uh, they were attacked and uh, we have seen the results of that attack uh, in this um, press piece that we've all read. What about uh, the IGAD or IGAD plus uh, uh, peace agreement which was signed in Addis Ababa? I'm talking here about between, of course, uh, President Salva Kiir and uh, some would say former first vice president, Dr. Riyak Machar. Is the peace deal, frankly, still on track? 
Uh, it certainly is not on track. Uh, we, we've seen what has happened since mid-July. Uh, there are reports of continued fighting. Uh, what we want to do is get them back on track toward implementation of this peace deal. Uh, we were all very uh, pleased when the deal was signed because we thought that this peace deal meant the end of the fighting and the end of the suffering of the people of South Sudan. And clearly, uh, that was not the case. Uh, it's not clear that those who signed the peace deal signed that peace deal with, uh, with a commitment to implementing, implementation of the, of the peace deal. But we're committed to seeing this peace deal implemented. We're committed to seeing this current uh, situation in. We're working very closely with uh, the EGAD neighbors uh, and leaders to push forward the regional uh, security force for Juba so that security can be established in Juba and we can start the process of moving the peace, uh, the, the peace agreement forward. What is the position of the United States in as far as the recent arrangements in Juba are concerned? I'm talking, of course, about uh, President Salva Kiir uh, appointing a General Taban Deng Gai as the new first vice president. And where is Dr. Riyak Machar? We haven't heard anything from the U.S. government about that. Well, certainly you hear from us every day on the situation in, in South Sudan. I think we have to, uh, in terms of the appointments of uh, individuals, we have to allow this government uh, to make those appointments. Uh, we, too, uh, wonder why uh, this decision was made. Uh, and we're looking forward and hoping that uh, there's a possibility that um, uh, Dr. Mashar is back, comes back to Juba, and they're able to... Uh, to continue the process that was started uh, before uh, the situation occurred in July. Let's go to neighboring Democratic Republic of Congo. Yes. We're talking about Beni, Eastern mm -hmm. DRC events that occurred uh, on August 13th. Mm -hmm. Your comment? Uh, again, sadness. Uh, and I can use that word uh, quite a bit uh, when I describe situations like that. Uh, the, these people uh, in eastern Congo, in Bini, uh, as you know, were attacked. Uh, we think somewhere between 50 and 100 people were killed. Uh, and um, the government and the UN are in the process now of investigating uh, who caused the, uh, the, the violence. And again, moving forward to hold them accountable. Uh, these are people, again, who have become victims of individuals who do not see their country's best interest, but are seeking uh, their, own, uh, uh, their own interest. How can this continue happening in a country where, until recently, you actually had the presence of the largest UN peacekeeping force? You even had uh, the SADC. Uh, intervention brigade, of course, uh, which fought against the M23 to boot. Uh, we do have the largest peacekeeping force in DRC, uh, and uh, they have been working uh, with others in the international community to try to find a peaceful w path for, uh, for DRC. Mm. But I have to say, in situations where people are bent on, on killing, uh, even uh, in situations where we do have UN uh, troops, uh, they are going to find a way to do that until we, uh, as the international community and countries themselves, deal with the root causes of, of these conflicts. Uh, they are related to uh, the distribution of resources. It's related to the people of the community benefiting from, uh, from the resources that are available. And it's uh, a result also of not dealing with uh, situations that uh, involve illicit uh, distribution and illicit uh, uh, trafficking of, uh, of a country's rich resources. Well, now we'll pause for a short break and would like to remind you that Straight Talk Africa is now on the social networking website Twitter. And we are tweeting live for us at VOA Shaka, that's VOA Shaka, and join in on today's discussion with your questions and comments. 
Don't forget to use the hashtag VOA US Africa Affairs. And we are still on Facebook. Just enter the keyword Straight Talk Africa. Become a fan and connect with other friends of the Voice of America. We'll be right back with you, so please don't go away. Like Voice of America on Facebook. Follow VOA on Twitter. Join VOA on our YouTube channel. Like, follow, join VOA. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. What is your opinion about today's topic? Call us at 202-619-3111. U.S. country code 1. When you call, remember the following. Ask only one question. Keep your comment brief and turn down the volume on your radio or television. Now let's return to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, Esther Gizu Ewert. And of course, this is Straight Talk Africa coming to you live from Washington. Yeah, you know, Linda, there was this great scientist at one time uh, by the name Albert Einstein. Mm -hmm. He once said, if you keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results, then frankly, it must be insanity. Look at the Democratic Republic of Congo. At one time it was Zaire, another time it was Congo, another time it was Belgian Congo. But nothing seems really to change because we keep having peacekeeping missions there and what have you, and there's no solution, frankly. There is a solution. What is the solution? The solution is democracy. Uh, it is allowing the people through a democratic process to elect their leaders. Uh, President Kabila has been in power for 10 years, and he actually has been, uh, the, the Democratic Republic of Congo has been relatively peaceful mm -hmm. during uh, most of the first years of, of, of his power. There were issues, of course, but relatively peaceful. And I think he has an opportunity now to take DRC back uh, uh, into another chapter, and that is to transition this government at the end of his term, allow for free and fair and transparent elections, and the election of a new president. Uh, that would be a legacy that no one in the history of the Democratic Republic of Congo has ever left. And if President Kabila could leave that legacy, I think he will go down in history as breaking that cycle of repeating the same mistakes over and over again. It is interesting in the sense that uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, whether you call it Congo Zaire, has never really experienced peaceful transfer of power. Exactly. So this would be a first, and it would be legacy, and it would be historical, and I think, again, that uh, it will place President Kabila in a place in history that no one else in the history of DRC has ever been. But when you look at uh, the region, mm -hmm. I am talking about the Great Lakes region, you look at uh, neighboring Rwanda, for example, you look at Burundi, uh, you look, in fact, at Uganda, you look at uh, Angola, you look at uh, the Republic of Congo, which used to be Congo Brazzaville, and then you go to Gabon, you go to Equatorial Guinea, really, Mm -hmm. Why would you expect President Joseph Kabila to be different, really? Because he is different, and he can be different, and he can be the role model, uh, unlike these other countries that you have uh, described. He doesn't have to follow that route. Uh, he can establish his own road, his own path for his country. And he's also different because we're talking about the largest country among all those countries you described uh, in terms of areas in space, but also in terms of population and in terms of resources. Incredible resources. So it's, it, he is different, the country is different, and there's an opportunity there that none of these other countries took advantage of, and he can set the, the model and establish the path 
for the people of uh, DRC. A country that borders with nine other countries. Nine other countries. There was a man in town in the 1990s. Uh, his name was Bill Clinton. Mm, I think I know him. He basically said uh, that uh, right from Asmara, we're talking about Isaias Afawaki. Mm -hmm. We moved next door to Ethiopia, Meles Zednawi. Uh, rest in peace, of course, uh, he's gone. Then you go south to Uganda, Yoweri Museveni. Then you go to Rwanda, Paul Kagame or Pastor Bizimungu, whoever was in the part at the time. And then, interestingly, you move to Kinshasa, mm -hmm. Rora Desire Kabira. And he said these were beacons of hope for African democracy. Well, was he right? I think he was right at that time. In what sense? Uh, in the sense that we saw opportunities. I see Kabila as a beacon of hope. Now, I may be proved right, and I hope I am, but I could also be proven wrong. And I think what uh, former President Clinton saw was hope. And what we are seeing is the lack of these leaders taking advantage of the opportunity to be agents of change. So he was right. They were wrong. You obviously have had a very rare opportunity of interacting with a lot of these players. Mm -hmm. When you talk to them, what is the chemistry like? It's positive. Uh, I, my approach to any conversation, whether it's with a head of state or a market woman or a child on the street, is to listen. Uh, I give people the opportunity to tell me what they're thinking so that I can understand who they are and, mm -hmm. and what they're thinking. And then that also gives me an opportunity to formulate how I, I will respond to them. And I think for me, the chemistry has been positive uh, because I have been, I've always been respectful. I don't know that any African leader uh, will say that I've been disrespectful, mm -hmm. but I've also pressed them on very tough, hard issues. And in some cases, I've been successful. In others, I have not succeeded, but I keep trying. I, I've, ne I've never given up hope. Do you think that uh, they deserve to be characterized as leaders, or are they in fact rulers, as some people have suggested? Because, frankly, there seems to be a disconnect between these leaders and their people. Uh, they get elected, many of them, and many of them in, in what, elections. In what type of election? Uh, that's what I was about to say. Many of them in elections that raise some doubt about the transparency, but some in elections that have been uh, transparent. Um, and so they have an opportunity to show their people what they can do. And I agree with you that many have not uh, taken their leadership roles seriously. They have not led their people down a path of success. And there's no reason any country in Africa should not be successful. Uh, even as they deal with some of the most difficult challenges, when we think about Liberia and Sierra Leone and Guinea dealing with Ebola, uh, we think about the wars and the famine and uh, the other, you know, the floods that we deal with on the continent of Africa, I still think that every single country in Africa could be prosperous, mm -hmm. despite all of that. And what is lacking is strong leadership. When you talk about um, elections, of course, a lot of people will agree that uh, holding an election by itself, frankly, is not a democracy. You have to have an environment uh, where the playing field is leveled. Uh, mm -hmm. You have to have uh, all parties having unfettered access to the media, for example, and having an opportunity to sell their message to their people. But in a lot of these countries, especially in that region, you're talking about uh, incumbent presidents, frankly, mm -hmm. who enjoy competing against the people whose hands are tied behind their backs and their feet are tied together. And when they say, when they punch, they say punch back. How can you possibly call, frankly, that an election? You know, ele elections, as you stated, are only one part of the democratic process. I see it uh, like a puzzle. And so one piece of the puzzle doesn't make the puzzle. Mm -hmm. And you have to keep building and adding pieces to, to the puzzle. 
And we've seen some examples where we have added pieces to those puzzles, mm -hmm. and each time it gets better. Uh, I would like to refer to Nigeria. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt in anyone's mind that that election was one that was well done and reflected the will of the people. I think we saw that happen in Burkina Faso, and that didn't happen overnight. Benin. Benin. It does, didn't happen overnight. It was building on small successes mm. until you get bigger successes. So I'm still hopeful. I like the idea that countries have bought into the concept of elections. Now they have to move it to the next step, that they are transparent elections with a level playing field uh, where each candidate is allowed to engage with their supporters and campaign in uh, a way that they can win an election freely and fairly. And that's not always the case. You know, there was once a great American president, and his name was called Abraham Lincoln. He basically no, characterized uh, democracy as a government of the people, by the people, for the people. Mm -hmm. But critics, frankly, will tell you that uh, the type of democracy that we are seeing in many African countries is probably basically characterized as a government of some people, by some people, for some people. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would agree with that. But I also would add to that that we're seeing those some people become more and more people. And again, I'm hopeful that eventually we will end up in a place across the continent of Africa where we do have governments that are representative of the will of, of the people. I think the people of Africa are committed. When you see so many Africans lining up to vote, uh, despite the fact uh, that they sometimes know that it's not going to end up in a result that they respect or that they desire, mm -hmm. but they continue to do it. Uh, and it's because they have hope. So we have to continue to have hope with them that they will eventually come to a place where they're in a country that has uh, uh, elections that, and where they elect people who are about the people. The people have absolutely no problem. The problems are with the people who claim to lead them because they seem to frankly be imposters, so to speak. Yeah, they got to hold them accountable. Yes, and the critics say that uh, you have a problem when it comes to that, uh, the United States of America, frankly. Mm -hmm. You seem to talk the talk, but you do not walk the talk. Please. So that the African ordinary person can walk the walk democratically. We, not only do we walk the talk, we do or talk the walk, we walk the talk as well. And, uh, and I know that that's the case because I know that people want us there. There is no election that happens in any country in Africa where we're not asked to be there. And sometimes we're even asked in many cases by governments who want us there. Mm -hmm. uh, I will recall in the small country of Comores, uh, when I met with the president, he said, can you send us election observers? And we did. Mm. Uh, so we, we believe in what we preach. Can we deliver on what we preach? We can only deliver on what we preach if that's what the people want, that's what the government wants, and that there are institutions, many times we've supported them and helped build their capacity, that can deliver uh, good elections to, to the people. Do you agree with some people who have said that uh, if it wasn't for the pressure from Washington, we would not have had an election in Nigeria whose results ended up reflecting the will of the Nigerian people? No, I don't agree with that. I think the reason the Nigerians had good elections is because the Nigerian people wanted good elections and we were there to help them. Uh, it was not our goal or our initiative, it was their initiative and their goal, and we supported them. I see. You are tuned into Straight Talk Africa, and we'll have more of a discussion in a moment. But first, here is Mariam Jero. Take it away, Mariam. Well, thanks, Shaka. Still to come, we'll reveal some of what our audience had to say through our social media platforms on what kind of relationship Africa ought to have with America. Stay with us. Today's youth are not just the next generation of African leaders, they are today's leaders, and this is the time to invest in them, 
today, not tomorrow. So let's connect. Let's engage with each other on issues that will transform our societies. Innovation, leadership, entrepreneurship, things that you're doing to move the continent forward to make you the greatest generation that Africa has known. It's up front every Wednesday, 1730 UTC, right here on The Voice of America. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. Call us now with your questions and comments. The number is 202-619-3111 and the U.S. country code is 1. Call us direct and we'll call you right back. Remember to turn down the volume on your radio or television and keep your comments brief. Now back to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, Esther Gidi, you what? And welcome back to Straight Talk Africa, live from Washington. Once again, it's time to bring in my colleague and social media reporter, Mariama. Take it away again, Mariama. Well, thanks, Shaka. Today's discussion on the political turmoil in South Sudan, recent African elections and the latest on Boko Haram, and so much more lead us to our question of the week, which asks, why is the relationship between the United States and Africa important well we'll start with a viewer in liberia who answered our question in this letter of the week william kokulo from liberia writes the relationship between the united states and africa is very important this allows africa to build bilateral relationships with america that will see u.s support to infrastructure development strengthening security sectors and promoting liberal democracies in africa well uh, that was uh, william uh, kokulo in liberia who stated uh, that indeed the relationship between the two is a pretty important something others uh, disagree uh, disagree with but before we move on uh, to those comments uh, thanks everyone for using all our social media platform to communicate with us uh, just a quick reminder that we are tweeting live today just use the hashtag VOA US Africa affairs and if you haven't yet uh, do follow us on Twitter speaking of it let's go to a tweet uh, from Peter Isaac in Tanzania who says that in my perspective, uh, I see there's no advantage in a relationship, but the crackdown only in Africa. Well, another uh, tweet uh, from Jean-Louis uh, Cain Tenkore, uh, from, or from his handle, at uh, Caiza, uh, writes that Africa's, uh, complexities, um, Africa's complexities and challenges have been at the bottom, but at the same time, full of hopes for better days ahead. Let's look at one more tweet uh, while we are at it. Uh, this time it's uh, Emmanuel uh, Cacciele who said, uh, yes, it is, uh, but this U.S.-Africa relationship will be more meaningful if it takes Africa to better economic levels. Well, we'll leave Twitter and uh, turn to our Facebook followers. Uh, with this post uh, from Miyandam Paka Laiti from Zambia, who writes, America is a superpower in technology that Africa needs. Their research is above board, and their science discoveries provide medical solutions to Africa. Well, we have a wide range of opinions here. You can pick and choose where you'd like to start. Linda, your reaction, yes. please. I think the question is a very loaded question uh, because it asks about uh, the relationship between Africa and why this relationship uh, should exist. And it should exist, I, I think, I, I think your, your viewers gave us some great ideas, but more importantly, these relationships are important because of the people. They're important because of the connections between the people of Africa and the people of the United States. The United States has the largest Africa diaspora uh, population of any country in the world. Perhaps with the exception of Brazil. W perhaps Brazil. Mm -hmm. uh, and so with that large Africa diaspora, we must remain connected to these countries. And the individuals who come from these countries must help us keep those bridges of, of connections open. 
But I also agree that being uh, where we are in our development and looking at where African countries are in their development, that we can help Africa move up the development ladder. The kinds of medical research that the last uh, responders spoke about, I think is key uh, to helping Africa move forward uh, in uh, dealing with some of the issues that Africa is dealing with and take the Ebola crisis. Africa could not deal with that issue alone. We could not deal with that issue alone. And the three countries who were burdened with the Ebola crisis could not deal with the issue at all uh, because of their lack of capacity. So those relationships helped us respond, but it also built a coalition around the continent to help these countries uh, respond to something that was extraordinarily uh, difficult and devastating to the population. Mariama, any more reaction from the audience, please? Yes, a lot more. Uh, let's go to a comment from Prosim Vic in Uganda, who writes, uh, yes, Africans need uh, the United States because we can't survive on our own. This dependence was planned long ago. So those people who believe we can survive by ourselves should think twice about it. One more comment, another one from Facebook. We stay uh, with that uh, from, uh, this time from Jay Arsenault. Uh, from here in the United States who writes that America does not have a blanket policy for Africa. It has individual policies for each African nation. The policies on the U.S. toward Africa depends on many things like joint interest in trade and security. Interesting point, uh, points from both uh, viewers and all listeners. Your thoughts once again. What about that, Madam Ambassador? Well, our uh, writer from Uganda, I have to disagree with you. Africa can be independent and Africa can survive on its own. Africa has enormous resources that are not uh, being uh, used in a way that contribute to its uh, independence. And uh, it's important that the extraordinarily talented and ambitious young people across this continent start to work together to ensure that as we go into the next century that you are prepared to be the leaders on, on this globe. And I think uh, Africa has the potential to do that. And then on the other issue that the U.S. does not have uh, a policy on Africa that we have a policy that only reflects our individual relationship uh, with countries uh, that's also not on the mark. When you look broadly, uh, look at the Young African Leaders Initiative. This is not about a single country. It's about the continent. We brought a thousand young people here to the United States this past summer who were able to hone their leadership skills, build on uh, their own ambitions and uh, had the opportunity to engage with each other. And for me, that is the most important benefit of, of YALI is that these young people from across the continent have an opportunity to, to talk to each other and to share with each other. We have Power Africa. Power Africa is about bringing 60 million new households connected to electricity. Mm. Imagine the impact of uh, such an initiative across the continent of, of Africa, lighting up uh, homes and schools and hospitals and industries and helping Africa go into uh, the next generation. Trade Africa, again, a very powerful initiative that looks at how we can encourage not only trade between African countries in the United States, but it's about trade between African countries and African regions, because there's a huge market in Africa mm -hmm. that is not being taken advantage of. And we have put millions of dollars toward uh, supporting, uh, supporting that effort. So those are just a, a few examples, and I think there are many other examples. But I think what, if I can leave with one thing on these two comments, is that we have to uh, keep uh, the hope. We have to keep building on uh, the successes that we've had. We have to keep looking for new opportunities for Africa to move forward. Terrific. Uh, 
Thanks, Mariama, for bringing us this week's audience reaction. Well, thank you, Madam Ambassador, for shedding some light uh, on these issues uh, for our audience. That will do it for today's uh, social media segment. Just a reminder that we appreciate all the feedback, whether it's in social media form or using other means to communicate to us. Please keep them coming. If you are a new fan, just drop us a line at africatv at voanews.com. Once again, our email address is africatv at voanews.com or post your comment on our Facebook page. Just enter the keywords Straight Talk Africa. Be sure to visit us online at voaafrica.com or you can join our YouTube channel. Sign up to VOA TV to Africa and don't forget to follow us on Twitter at VOA Shaka. A reminder that the show is indeed uh, streaming live every Wednesday. Just go to the VOA Straight Talk Africa TV program page on our website or simply watch us live on your mobile device. Just download the VOA mobile app. So no excuses not to watch or listen to our show. Well, now let's take a look at what's on tap for next week's program. Next week on Straight Talk Africa, Africa's performance at the Rio Olympics. We'll discuss how African athletes fared at the 2016 Summer Games. That's next week, right here on Straight Talk Africa. Welcome back. And today, of course, it's a conversation with America's top Africa diplomat, Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield, the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State. For African affairs. Of course, again, I have to say how profoundly honored I am and exceedingly humbled, frankly, to have the opportunity to interact with you. Thank you. You're most welcome. Earlier, you mentioned something about uh, YALI, the Young African Leaders uh, Initiative, uh, obviously initiated by uh, U.S. President Barack Obama, now popularly known as the Mandela Washington Fellowship. Mm -hmm. Um, what is the reaction from the ground? Obviously, the fellows, uh, you know, when you meet them, you, you can simply see the, uh, the body language and everything and whatever you, they are overwhelmed. Yes. But what about the African leaders themselves? When you interact with them, what is their reaction to that? Uh, that's, that's a great question, because when this program started in 2014, right. uh, with the first large group of, uh, of fellows, uh, the leaders were suspicious. Correct. Uh, we had uh, the President's Africa Leaders uh, Summit, mm -hmm. where we brought African leaders to, uh, to the United States, and the Yali Fellows were here at the same time. Correct. And we got questions like, what are you doing with our young? Uh, why are you bringing our young people and you are brainwashing our young people mm -hmm. to rise up against us? And it's been a very uh, difficult struggle mm. to bring them around. Mm. But I think we've actually succeeded. I think most of the heads of state now see the benefit of this program. I don't visit a country in Africa where I meet with a head of state where I don't bring up Yali really? directly to the head of state. And I ask that they meet with their Yali, with our Yali uh, supported fellows that the heads of state themselves meet with these young people because they are your young people is my message to them. And they are smart and they want to see their country succeed. And you need to know them. Mm. They are not rebels. Uh, they're not terrorists. They're ambitious, they're young, and they want to be successful. And they're yours. And I am seeing more and more enthusiasm uh, for this program by African leaders. And uh, I think that uh, they are beginning to see the importance because we have a very youthful continent here. Mm -hmm. We have a continent in which 60, 70 percent of the population are people under the age of 30, 35 years old. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so if you don't engage with those young people, uh, your country is doomed. And these leaders and the older generation will not live forever. So I think they understand the importance of engaging youth, giving them the capacity to grow. I hope the perception has changed because uh, 
I have been told by some of the um, Yali fellows that uh, their leaders, frankly, uh, still have uh, those suspicions. They think that uh, it's America which is now deciding, uh, uh, essentially, to choose who should be future leaders of their countries. No, it, you know, I've heard that from, uh, from some leaders as well. Uh, and we've tried to be extraordinarily transparent. Uh, this is an ex it, it's, a, it's a transparent program. Mm -hmm. These young people apply online. Uh, in some countries, some government officials actually read through applications and help uh, to select candidates. Mm -hmm. uh, they are selected based on what's in their head, Correct. what they are, have accomplished, and what they were able to put on paper to impress the people who are reading. Uh, we don't want a program where people are being chosen because of who they know or people are being chosen because of who they were born, uh, who, who their parents are. Uh, so it's open to entire populations. We look far and beyond. We look, into, look in rural areas. Uh, we try to get young people who are from every sector uh, of, of a country. And I think we, ha we have been very, very successful. Many of them are people who are in government, and many are people in the private sector. And uh, there are people who are working in the power and energy sector as well as those who are working in uh, the uh, public sector. I have to admit that uh, some of the fellows that I've had the opportunity to meet, frankly, um, give me a sense as some of the best and brightest anywhere. Well, a reminder that you are tuned in to Straight Talk Africa. If you wish to participate in our discussion, please call us at 202-619-3111. Your country code is one. We'll continue our discussion in a moment, so please, don't go away. We are able to touch on things that are important to people on an everyday basis. We hope that our viewers are getting inspired when they watch our show. They're getting a view of the world from a different perspective. Things that perhaps are not in their immediate vicinity. Today, I could put in on the show something that is a little different, a little unique. And this gives me that, uh, you know, inspiration to come to work. If you like today's show, please write and tell us what you think or give us some suggestions. Be sure to tell us what station you're tuned into. Our address, Straight Talk Africa, Voice of America, 330 Independence Avenue Southwest, Washington, D.C., 20237 USA. Or send us an email at africatv at voanews.com. Log on to our website at voaafrica.com or post your comments on Facebook. Keywords, Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, Esther Gizhi, you word, and of course, welcome back to Straight Talk Africa, coming to you live from Washington. Let's talk about um, the fight against terrorism. And we talk about um, our Shabab, uh, specifically in Somalia. What is, uh, what is the latest? Does it look good? It looks like the presidential elections have been postponed. Uh, I think it does look good. Mm. Uh, and yes, the elections were postponed, but only for uh, a brief period. So we're still hopeful that these elections are going to take place, and they're going to take place sooner uh, rather than later. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that Somalis have come together to organize themselves to have this uh, election and again, it's not a one-person, one-vote election. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a fully representative election, but it's better than what they did before, and we think the next time it will be better than, uh, uh, than this time. Uh, I think the fight against, uh, against al-Shabaab, mm -hmm. uh, it continues, but I think uh, we have to uh, admit that we've had some successes. Uh, working with our Amazon partners uh, and other partners in that region, uh, we have pushed al-Shabaab back. Mm -hmm. They're not holding territory anymore. Mm -hmm. They're using asymmetric methods that reflect the fact that they can no longer hold territory. Mm -hmm. And so we, we know the fight isn't over, uh, and we have to continue to support uh, our partners, uh, particularly the troop contributing countries of Amazon, uh, to continue the fight against al-Shabaab until that fight is over. And Amazon seems to be doing a terrific job. I just completed reading a book uh, 
uh, whose title is Black Hawks Rising mm -hmm. by Ugandan born Canadian called Opio Oloya. Okay, he I says seen uh, that book. Amazon has made a significant difference that you can't definitely compare it with Black Hawks Down. Yeah, I agree. You agree? I do. How do you respond to people who will say, fine, you as a country, the United States, uh, you have what you call your vital national security interests. Mm -hmm. But that frankly, what you have done lately is focusing more about fighting terrorism at the expense of promoting democracy. That without democracy, you will probably continue having terrorism anyway. You have to do both. You absolutely have to do both. Mm. But the impact of terrorism is so immediate, it is so in your face, that every effort has to be put toward ending the impact of terrorism on, on populations. Mm. But you must also continue to focus on building uh, capacity, mm -hmm. on good governance, on uh, governments being in a position to provide for the needs of, of their people. Mm -hmm. uh, People want governments that are transparent. Uh, they want governments that are not corrupt. Uh, they want governments that provide schools and hospitals and roads and water and electricity. And those things are as important to them as fighting terrorism, which is why I uh, say that we have to do both. I will admit that it's easier to get money to fight terrorism uh, than it is to get money to support democracy and governance. I see. Well, I gather that uh, we have to go for the lifeline of the show, which are the telephone callers. Yes. Let's go to um, Kwame from Georgia. Hello, jo hello, Kwame, are you there? Are you there? I can't hear you. Hello, Kwame? What about uh, Tafa? Tafa from Ghana? Can you hear me? Yes, please, I can hear you. Yes. Oh, my question is: the, um, I would like to ask you uh, if uh, if she could, if she could explain to me uh, why the U.S. the U the U.S. the U.S. government has been so harshly judgmental about Burundi's president seeking a re-election, while it has stood by so quietly, uh, while the president of Rwanda, Paul Kagame, has amended is the country's constitution so he can stay in the office for another 18 years. Thank you. Is that Kwame? Are you from Burundi? Yes, I'm, I'm Kwame from I'm, Togo. From Togo? Please. I see. Okay, I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry. He says that uh, he, doesn't real, he doesn't understand why you are focused on Burundi, uh, where you somehow don't allow the president to you know, feel comfortable serving his term, whether it is shifting the constitutional goalposts or not, whereas his neighbors, for example, like Paul Kagame, is going to be a life president, and you haven't said anything of substance yet about that issue. Well, first, let me respond to the, the last part of that question. I think if you look at our statements, we have been very, very clear, both in the case of Rwanda and other countries in the region, uh, in regards to our... Uh, response to uh, decisions that are made to change constitutions uh, that benefit the president in office serving for life. It is something that we have expressed our opposition to in the strongest terms. In regards to Burundi, uh, your president uh, made a decision to change the constitution, uh, to run for a third term, and now he's there. And what he needs to do is start to manage this country, rule this country, provide leadership to this country, and prepare the country for the transition that will take place following uh, his current uh, leadership. And we're just not seeing that. Uh, we, we want to see, and I think the people of Burundi and I would argue that even you want to see this country start the process of rebuilding itself. And we're waiting for that to happen. In fairness to uh, President Nkurunziza of Burundi, he did not change the constitution. You might say mm -hmm. that uh, he tweaked it, really, and with the support, by the way, or endorsement, of the constitutional court. Yeah. Uh, he, he actually re he interpreted 
uh, certain provisions in the Constitution to allow himself to run for a third term. Of the Arusha Accord. Uh, of the Arusha Accord. Because the Arusha Accord is clear. Uh, the Arusha Accord only gives the president two terms. Mm -hmm. uh, the Constitution has a quirk in it by saying two elected, elected. terms. And he was elected uh, once. And he was elected once. Now, he served 10 years. And my question is, what additional things does the president want to accomplish that he didn't accomplish during the 10 years he served? Right. And so he's there. And we want to see him move, move that forward. We disagreed on the interpretation of, uh, of the Constitution and on the accord, and I think most people in the country disagree. Your constitutional court disagreed. Now, Madam Ambassador, there are people who will say that when it comes, for example, to a military coup, mm -hmm. you drew a line. There is no way you can support such a government. Why mm -hmm. don't you do the same about incumbent presidents shifting political goalposts there for their personal interest. Why don't you draw a line? Uh, we probably uh, wouldn't have relations with any African country. Uh, we do have a line on coup d'etats. Uh, this is forceful takeover of governments, generally violent, that leads to significant uh, loss of life. And we will not uh, work uh, with, uh, with such governments. Uh, we will continue, even in those cases, to work with the people of, of the country and try to continue to, to build people-to-people -people relationships and relationships from our government to the people uh, through uh, our public programs. Uh, in the case of those who have changed their constitutions, we're not opposed to a country changing its constitution to allow for uh, uh, a third term or uh, unlimited terms, as long as it doesn't, it's not being done by the person who is in power to ensure that that person stays in power for life. Now that said, our basic view is you ought to have transitions. No president should serve for life. Hmm. People deserve the opportunity for change. Well, of course, if you serve for life, it means you're no longer a president. Yeah. You're a presidential monarch, perhaps. Yes. Well, what about uh, people who, frankly, would be interested in a person like you? Can you do us a favor and walk us through a day in the life of America's top Africa diplomat? Uh, wow, that's, that's interesting to do. It changes every single day. Uh, but uh, my office knows that I usually start at about 5 o'clock in the morning. 5 o'clock. Uh, and I start with reading emails. Mm -hmm. And my hope and desire when I open up my emails at 5 o'clock in the morning that I don't have to deal with a crisis. And most mornings that is the case. Uh, and I also use that time in the morning to make phone calls. Uh, I call to African leaders, I call to colleagues, I call our embassy, uh, our ambassadors uh, to talk about issues of concern. So on most days I will have a call. This morning I called at 6 a.m. Uh, my former French colleague, Jean-Christophe uh, Bellier, who has been promoted to a new position uh, at the EU. And I wanted to congratulate him, but also talk to him about issues uh, that we have mutual interest in, uh, both as uh, partners with the EU and also with, as partners with France. We're running out of time. Uh, I guess you go to Africa a lot. Uh, in I 10 do. seconds, what mode of transportation do you use? What kind of protection? Commercial? Uh, I don't use any protection. Transportation? Oh. Well, on that note, uh, thanks to our distinguished guest. Linda Thomas Greenfield, the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. Thanks to our field stations, along with our viewers and listeners. We thank you for tuning in. It was a pleasure, of course, having you. Get better, not bitter. And please remember to keep the African hopes alive. Thank you very much, and it's great to be here with you. You're most welcome.